This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu holds a high-stakes face-to-face meeting with Russia's president in Moscow. Plus, Israel's military warns Lebanon it's sitting on a powder keg. And a window into Israel, the startup nation. And one Jewish artist shares how she survived the horrors of the Holocaust. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu met with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Moscow, part of a high-stakes geopolitical chess match to keep Israel safe. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu took to Twitter to explain why he went to Moscow and met with Putin. I just finished good and intensive talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. I told him Israel views seriously two developments. First, Iran's attempt to establish itself militarily in Syria. The second, Israel's attempt to create in Lebanon precise weaponry to be used against Israel. I made it clear to him we won't agree to any one of these developments and we will act as needed. Netanyahu's meeting was followed up by an article by an Israeli general. He said Iran is turning Lebanon into one big missile factory while the international community looks the other way and warned the people of Lebanon they've become pawns in the hands of Iran. He wrote the ordinary citizen will be mistaken to think that this process turns Lebanon into a fortress. It is nothing more than a barrel of gunpowder on which he, his family and his property are sitting. One in every three or four houses in southern Lebanon is a headquarters, a post, a weapons depot or a Hezbollah hideout. We know these assets and know how to attack them accurately if required. Right now, uh, you know, Lebanon is effectively a fully owned franchise of Islamic Republic of Iran. Many Mideast observers like Jonathan Spire, the author of Days of the Fall, a reporter's journey in the Syria and Iraq wars, feel that Lebanon no longer controls its own destiny. What it confirms is just the extent to which today uh, Hezbollah and the other clients of uh, Iran have effectively swallowed up Lebanon. That's to say, from originally constituting a kind of state within a state in Lebanon, they have now, as of, of recent months, effectively swallowed up the real state. The General's article is just one of the latest warnings by Israel that the next war with Hezbollah will not be like the last one. This won't be like it was in 2006, a little kind of border skirmish or a series of skirmishes between the Israel Defense Forces and Hezbollah. No, this will have the dimensions of a state-to-state -state conflict. From Israel's point of view, Hezbollah and Lebanon today are the same thing. And if war comes again, therefore, it will be a war between the state of Israel and the state of Lebanon this time around. It remains to be seen if Lebanon, Russia and the international community will heed the warnings by Israel. You heard Middle East analyst Jonathan Spire in our story on Lebanon. We talked with Spire in our studio, not only about Iran's influence on Lebanon, but also about a new book he's written about the Syrian civil war. He brings a unique and valuable perspective on perhaps the worst human tragedy in the Middle East in a generation. Jonathan, thanks for being here with us on uh, CBN News. Well, Appreciate well, it. Chris. Uh, so you've written a new book, and it's called Days of the Fall, That's right. A Reporter's Journey in the Syria and Iraq Wars. Why did you write this? Well, basically, you know, I've been reporting from within Syria and Iraq pretty much since the civil war began in 2012. And uh, a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that I had amassed a kind of massive amount of material in terms of interviews and witness and pictures and impressions, which hadn't really managed to make uh, its way into the articles that I'd published over the years. So I just had this material there and I regarded it as of importance that people should, you know, have, uh, be made aware mm -hmm. of some of that stuff. Syria's come on and off the headlines over the last five, six years. But in the meantime, you know, half a million people have died. You know, six million people have uh, become internally displaced refugees. Four million people have left Syria. The, the, the numbers are massive and staggering. And I think it's important, you know, that people should be sort of, you know, be kept aware of just what's been going on then. Tell us about your experiences when you first went in and, and what was that like? Pretty much unprecedented, I think, in, in the modern history of the Middle East. What happened was that the Syrian regime you know, just lost control of a couple of its international borders. And the one which we took an interest in was the very long border between Syria and Turkey, 900 kilometers long, 
poorly policed by the Turks, poorly maintained, and the regime army doing their best to police it. And reporters, me among them, just began to make our way in there, you know, through the regime mm -hmm. lines, so to speak, and into the rebel-controlled enclaves at that time in northern Syria. So it was a very strange experience for many of us, you know, finding ourselves kind of crawling under the barbed wire and making our way, you know, with rebel convoys through mm -hmm. the, the regime lines. Yeah, so it was kind of a, a fascinating and uh, a very uh, interesting and, and strange experience, you know, which had never really been precedented and which didn't last that long until the, the Turks started beefing up the border. As we said before, the Salafi jihadis started right. kidnapping journalists and then it became impossible. And how were you received by the, uh, the, by the rebels? Initially, the rebels were very keen on, on journalists coming in. You know, it's important to remember uh, that before the rebellion became dominated by uh, jihadis and Islamists, there was a moment of, I'd say, about a year or so where the armed rebellion was dominated by non-Islamists, recently defected soldiers and officers from Assad's army. And these people very much wanted Western support and they wanted Western attention. In many ways, Western media attention was oxy their oxygen, you know. And it was kind of uh, fascinating to see as well, because northern Syria had been so repressed by the Assad regime. And suddenly you were witnessing people having, for the first time in their lives really, a, a real sense of freedom and a sense of freedom of expression and so on. Sadly, it didn't last long. But while it was there, it was something very fascinating to observe. Mm. Well, what are the lessons to be learned from, uh, from what happened? I guess maybe the opportunities missed mm -hmm. at the very beginning. I do think that the key lesson for Western policy to learn is that you, know, you have to get in quickly and act, and act fast. Um, I think what we've seen subsequently in Libya and in Egypt is that politics in the Middle East and the Arab world doesn't have to go the way of the Islamists and the jihadis. But if there's a vacuum, then it will. Um, if you don't want there to be a vacuum, you've got to get in fast before they do. And I think that in Syria, had there been a determined Western uh, attempt in the first six, seven, eight months of the armed uprising, to gather forces around Western supported individuals, senior officers of one kind or another, it might well have been possible to have built a non-Islamist army that could have then defeated the Assad regime. But because the Obama administration was, was you can say hesitant or, or basically reluctant or even unwilling to go down that road, the vacuum was left. It was filled by the Islamists with everything that has followed. Were there any kind of harrowing experiences for you there? And there was one occasion where we had to take refuge in a hospital called Dar al-Shifa Hospital in the Shah district of eastern Aleppo. While the district was under fire from regime aircraft, the rebels, of course, obviously no air capacity of their own, no an anti-aircraft capacity either at that time. So just completely helpless. A civilian population completely helpless being bombed by its own government, you know, mm. from the air indiscriminately. And a lot of people were getting hurt, a lot of people were killed. And that was a really, you know, that was a very harrowing experience just because the sense of, of helplessness. W what would you like uh, people to get from your book? I want them to take away, first of all, just the extent of the human tragedy that, uh, that underlies so much of what we have been covering in Syria and Iraq over the last five, six years. You know, we talk about policy, we talk about the interests of countries, and indeed we, we must do so. This is our duty to, to, to ferret out those, those situations, that logic. But we must I always remember, and this is what the book is trying to get across, that beneath all that, there are real people. You know, there are millions of real people whose, whose desires and whose interests are, are similar to, to ours, you know, and recognizable to us. And those people's lives have been you know, really torn apart and, and terribly affected by the events of the last six, seven years in Syria and Iraq. And that's the kind of central picture that I guess I'm trying to paint in the book. Well, Jonathan, it's great to be with you, and, and uh, great to be with you in Mosul not too it long was, ago, and, and, uh, and get your insight and expertise. And I would just wanted to recommend this book, Days of the Fall, A Reporter's Journey in the Syria and Iraq Wars. Uh, I don't know of any other uh, journalist uh, that really has uh, reported on the Syrian war like you have with the insight and your courage as well. Up next, see thousands of investors who are flocking to Israel to be part of the Startup Nation. Israel is a global leader in innovation. One crowdfunding platform is making a way for investors to become part of what's become known as the Startup Nation. Here's a look at the company that's bringing together investors and entrepreneurs. The company is called Our Crowd and it's brought 10,000 people from 90 countries around the world here to Jerusalem for a high-tech summit of innovation and investment. Our Crowd is the vision of Jonathan Medved. Our Crowd is the world's largest crowdfunding for startup platform. 
it's for accredited investors, people who have some resources in the US, you have to have a million dollars of assets outside of your home. But if you do, you can go to our crowd and you can choose startups that you would like to invest in. We're finding these companies. We then arrange an investment round and then we invite the crowd to join us. The summit has exhibits in a number of fields, including healthcare. They call this exhibit the doctor's office of the future. The doctor's office of the future is uh, basically giving patients, users, people, tools to manage their health conditions remotely uh, through technology and with the uh, use of their, their doctor who can be remote all over the world. Uh, and they could get the information uh, through their smartphones uh, as well as other technological devices. Shmuel Hirschberg promotes a product for sufferers of diabetes. This device uh, connects to your smartphone. You can manage all of your uh, blood glucose readings, uh, carb intake, physical activity and insulin through the device. And then that device can be shared, the information on the device can be shared with your uh, doctor, CDE, um, and get information that you need to help better manage your, your chronic disease. The summit included cutting edge technologies in a number of fields like robotics. We developed a special controller that connects to robotic arms and enable them to learn uh, visually by watching us. We apply all kinds of algorithms to extract from video streams the information that is important and we convert it into a, a way that the robot can perform the task. And the latest in cybersecurity. Two years ago, three years ago, it was science fiction. And now it's become science. So you heard of biometrics, we do behavioral biometrics. So like folding your arms this way as opposed to that way, you have preferences. You have the same preferences in how you type on the keyboard, hold your phone, or move your mouse. So by building a behavioral profile, a bank or other financial institution can actually authenticate you against your credentials. Your credentials may be used by someone or compromised. We can also tell if somebody's identity has been stolen and somebody's using that identity that doesn't belong to the owner. And the beauty is, this is continuous. So every five seconds, they get comfort that you are who you are. So if someone forcibly asks you to enter your information and then sits down at the machine that you're operating from, within five seconds, they'll know it's not you. Eddie Bees uses drones to save lives. With the ability to augment uh, data on top of drone feeds, in particular, the, the software was used during the hurricanes to help uh, first responders in, re in helping people after the hurricanes to save them and work with them. Additionally, the software has been used in the uh, California fires in northern and southern California, where they are, have a drone up in the air and they need to understand where are the firemen, where is the fire, and where are the critical infrastructure they need to save. So you can kind of think of like our software as in putting the intelligence on top of a video feed. This is all done in real time where the video feed is going to the drone pilot, to the people on the ground, as well as to the command and control center so they can understand where they need to put the assets in real time. So in, in particular, many there's been a lot of work in video uh, on drones and post-processing, but when you have something up in the air and the ability to take real-time decisions uh, can help save lives. BriefCam can catch criminals and protect citizens. What's unique about BriefCam is we're taking video surveillance footage and transforming that into actionable intelligence. And what that means is we're making it searchable, actionable, and quantifiable. And by making video searchable, actionable, and quantifiable, what we're able to do is help law enforcement protect what matters most our families, our cities, and our most revered national institutions. It has saved lives, it's prevented crimes. Brief Cam helped capture the Boston Marathon bombers, and it helped Sergeant Michael O'Hare to track down a kidnapper. The gentleman tried to lure a 10-year-old girl into a white van um, that was driving through the neighborhood. She resisted, he was insistent. Uh, finally, an adult on the street intervened just in time. He fled the scene, so the only video I had was video of him Clean the scene in a white van. Nothing I can use um, with any of my analytic or forensic programs to enhance a plate. So I went back and I ran two hours previous uh, video, uh, ran it through BriefCam instantaneously. Within 34 seconds, I had identified that individual and he is currently incarcerated for the crimes he tried to commit. A big part of the summit is networking. Entrepreneurs and investors come together for potential partnerships. Our crowd for us is, you know, it, it's in the name, our crowd. It, it really, uh, it reflects their vision and it brings people together in terms of business development opportunities. Um, it's second to none. Our crowd is not just the 
primary platform for investment into Israeli startups and technology. It's a radical, I think, kind of global transforming concept of enabling investors, small and large, to have access to the kind of both innovative technologies and disruptive type of companies with business models like ours in one place, through one platform. This is a way of, in a, in a crash, uh, meeting all the people that uh, we're looking for. You know, it's, uh, it saves us a lot of time, it gives us a lot of exposure, uh, it, it enables us to uh, meet the people that we're looking for in just one place, it's amazing. Medved sees it as prophecy unfolding. And Zachariah, it talks about it, a t it, you know, near the end of days, people will flock here to Israel um, because they will see that the good news is coming from Israel. They will grab the, the cloak, it says in Zechariah, of uh, a, a local resident and say, I see that God is with you. Take, him, take me to him. And this is, uh, I think, this kind of prophecy is coming true, you know, in, in these days here in Israel. Mm -hmm. Up next, the nations commemorate the Holocaust, and one survivor shows how she made it through. Recently, Israel commemorated International Holocaust Memorial Day. Six million Jews died at the hands of the Nazi Third Reich. Of those who survived, about 200,000 live in Israel. Here's the unique way one of them shares her experience. This painting is a recent one. I named it uh, uh, The Wounded Survivor. Rita Kazimel Brown was seven years old when the Nazis invaded her hometown of Termot in Poland. Rita is now a recognized Holocaust artist who has worked as an art therapist. Her survival experience is the theme of many of her paintings. I'm the wounded survivor. I always uh, painted myself in white. I think it uh, has to do with not so white nightgown that I survived the whole Holocaust in. At 80, Rita okay. is bubbly and vibrant. Okay. If not for her artwork and her story, you might never know her painful past. Yet she carries her memories with her every day. Her story is told in the book, Portrait of a Holocaust Child, Memories and Reflections. Rita told CBN News how she and her family escaped the ghetto and survived in what they called the grub. And my father went away for a few, for a few days. And what he did, he found another Christian family in a little town called Malaki. And there he dug a big pit under the stable and it had a connection to the potato bin and a ledge you can open to the, to the farmer's uh, uh, home. My father and uh, my mother and the two little kids were with, her, with them and only my little brother could stand up. And I was lying in the passageway from the pit to the potato bin. This is how we lived 20 months. We were hungry and fearful and uh, it was just a living hell. It was, we called it, uh, it was a living grave. Being awake was a nightmare, she said, hour by hour, suffering day and night. Most of her father's 12 siblings died, where her little family of five stayed alive. Being creative helped me survive, but not only survive, but keep my sanity. In 2006, Rita revisited Poland for the first time to join the March of the Living. While there at Auschwitz, a spider bite took special significance. And there is this black spider that bit me, and it looks a little bit like a swastika. Yeah. And it's also soaked with blood. A mother of two and grandmother of three, she's seen many miracles in her life. We have kind of a, a survival instinct, which was very strong, but now it's weakening because when you get older, your, your defenses go down. and so. The only thing that we have is because of our children and grandchildren. That's our victory. Yelena is a widow who survived the horrors of the Holocaust. But when she faced financial challenges, CBN Israel came alongside to help. Yelena is a widow who lives alone in her small apartment in Jerusalem. 
Her hardships began when she was born in a Ukrainian ghetto during the Holocaust. My mother gave birth to me soon after the Nazis took over our community. We were hunted by the SS from the start. Elena's mother took her from house to house looking for any non-Jewish person willing to help. They hid under the floorboards as the SS conducted searches. My mother tried to give me her milk, but it was blood. It was a miracle. I didn't cry. If he had been discovered, we would have been shot right there. Yelena and her mother survived the Holocaust. Years later, she got married and moved to Israel. Her husband recently passed away and she can barely afford her apartment and not much else. So CBN Israel regularly takes her groceries and visits with her. I'm very happy when you come see me and bring me the wonderful food. It brightens my day. We also invite Yelena and other Holocaust survivors to social events we host in their honor. Christians play music for the survivors, listen to their stories, and share a meal with them. Yelena and the others get canes or walkers if they need them. Sometimes I don't feel strong in my legs. This cane helps keep me steady so I don't fall. I'm so grateful you gave it to me. Thanks to CBN Israel, Yelena is able to have a more active and fulfilling life. I say from all of us Holocaust survivors, thank you. You give love and support through this food and this events. God bless you and may you have the same peace in your heart that you have given me. Yelena's story is a reminder that the number of Holocaust survivors is dwindling and need our support. That's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.